In this lecture, we take up the creation and perfection of secured transactions. Now, we know that sellers and lenders do not want to risk non-payment. And we've seen various tools that both sellers and lenders have to lessen the risk of non-payment. Payments of debt can be secured by personal or real property. This property is going to act as a guarantee of repayment, and if repayment does not occur, then the properties uh, will go to the lender. Now, the concept of the secured transaction is basic to modern business. And when we talk about secured transactions in the UCC, Article 9 of the UCC governs secured transactions. So today we're going to look at Article 9, its terminology, and its operations. And after this lecture, you should be able to answer the following questions. What are the most important definitions associated with secured transactions? How are secured interests created? And what does it mean to perfect a security interest? And finally, what is the purpose of perfection? Now, at the core of secured transactions law, the law that we'll be studying in this segment of the course, is the concept of the security interest. In any credit extension, anytime a lender lends money, there are questions for that prospective lender to ask. Things like, can I get repaid? If not, can I secure the loan with collateral? And how do I make sure my rights in the collateral are superior to anyone else's? Now, before we can go into secured transactions, there's a number of definitions that we have to uh, get to. And we start with this most basic definition of a secured transaction. Now, secured transaction is a transaction in which the payment of a debt is guaranteed or secured by collateral. And in a secured transaction, the debtor must own or have a legal interest in the collateral. And when we talk about collateral, collateral is the property, either real or personal, that is subject to a security interest. There are some other definitions that we need to review, starting with security agreement. What is a security agreement? A security agreement is an agreement that creates or memorializes the security interest that is granted by a debtor to a secured party. So in exchange for the extension of credit from the creditor to the debtor, the debtor is going to give to the creditor a document that memorializes a security interest in certain property. Another important definition to know, of course, is who's a debtor. A debtor is the party who owes payment or performance of a secured obligation, whether or not she yet owns or has any rights in the collateral. And finally, a secured party, the creditor, is a lender, seller, or any other person who's a beneficiary of a security interest, including a person to whom accounts uh, are sold. You'll often hear of parties selling their promissory notes. Now, a, sure, a secured creditor has two main concerns if the debtor defaults. If the debtor fails to repay the amount of money that has been taken, a secured creditor has two concerns. First of all, can the debt be satisfied through the repossession and sale of the collateral? And secondly, will the creditor have priority over any other creditors who may have rights in the same collateral? Now, to become a secured party, the creditor must obtain a security interest in the collateral of the debtor. And in order to do this, three requirements must be met for a creditor to have an enforceable security interest. First of all, the debtor must have rights in the collateral. The debtor must have some ownership interest 
in the collateral and the property to be pledged for repayment of the debt. The secured party must give value in exchange for an interest in the collateral, meaning the secured party must give up something in exchange for this security interest. And ordinarily, that is the extension of credit. The secured party is going to loan money in exchange for this interest in the collateral. And finally, either there must be a written or authenticated security agreement that describes the collateral in such a way that it can be reasonably identified and is authenticated by the debtor or, so there must be a written security agreement that describes the collateral and is authenticated by the debtor, or the secured party must, depending on the type of collateral, possess, control, or take delivery of the collateral. So in order to have an enforceable security interest, debtor has to have rights in the collateral, the secured party must have given value, and finally there must be either a written security agreement that describes the collateral and is signed by the, by the debtor, or the secured party must actually take possession or control of the collateral. And once those requirements are met, the creditor's rights are said to attach to the collateral. Attachment gives to the creditor an enforceable security interest in the collateral. Once the rights have attached, at that point, the creditor now has an enforceable security interest in the collateral, meaning the creditor has an interest in that property, whatever that is, real or personal. They may not be the only party that has an interest, but they certainly do have an interest. Now, the next thing we need to take up is perfection. And perfection is the process by which a secured party is going to protect its security interest in the collateral. And when I say protect that security interest, they protect it against the claims of any other third party who is looking to that same collateral to satisfy the debtor's obligations to that third party. So we protect our rights in the collateral. We protect our secured interest through a process called perfection. For every type of collateral, a secured party can perfect her security interest in one or more of the following ways. First, they can file a financing statement against the collateral. They can take possession of the collateral or somehow exercise control over the collateral. Or they can create what's called an automatically perfecting security interest. So perfection is going to be obtained by either filing a financing statement, which as we'll see is the most common means of perfection, by taking possession of the collateral or exercising control over the collateral, or creating an automatic security interest, an automatically perfecting security interest. And the most common means of perfection is by filing a financing statement. A financing statement is a document that the secured party files to give notice to third parties that it claims an interest in the debtor's property. And in order to be valid, a financing statement must provide the debtor's name, the secured creditor's name, and a description of the collateral by item or type. Now this financing statement, there is a, a, a uniform financing statement available. Creditors now have a uniform financing statement available and you can read more about that in your textbook. 
Now the financing statement has to be filed. And so what do we mean by filing? Filing consists of communication of the financing statement to the appropriate filing office. Now communication can be by either actually taking a physical paper document to the appropriate filing office, or nowadays most communication is done by electronic means, by filing electronically. Now, we'll, if, in fact, a financing statement can be filed even before a security agreement is made. Now, as I said, filing consists of communication of the financing statement to the appropriate filing office. Now, how do we know what the appropriate filing office is? Well, financing statements against certain goods must be filed in the county where the collateral is located. So items like fixtures, timber that is yet to be cut, and collateral that's going to be extracted from the ground, like oil or minerals. Some financing statements must be filed in the county in which the collateral is located. All other financing statements are going to be filed with the Secretary of State office in the vast majority of, of states or to a comparable statewide filing office. In Oklahoma, we do not use the Secretary of State's office to take um, filing statements, financing statements. Instead, they are filed with the Oklahoma County Clerk's Office. And this is a sort of a historical quirk where, by which the Oklahoma County Clerk was already doing this work and the state felt it would be most efficient just to shift that burden uh, onto the Oklahoma County Clerk's Office. In most other states that you will be involved with, including in Texas, financing statements are going to be filed with the Texas Secretary of State. The financing statements have to be filed in the proper state. A financing statement must be filed against an individual in her state of residence. Wherever the individual lives, we must file that in the Secretary of State's office in the state of residence. Now, if it's a corporation or some other form of registered entity, then in its state of incorporation or registration. So a corporation or an LLC is going to be filed in the state in which it was incorporated. Any, a, a financing statement against any other entity in the state in its place of business the state of its place of business, or if it has more than one place of business in the state of its chief executive office. A financing statement must name the debtor correctly. A financing statement filed against a corporation must use the actual corporate name of the debtor. And that corporate name is going to be indicated in the public records. So if there is a difference between Smith Company, comma, Inc. and Smith Company dot or comma LLC, there's going to be a difference in those names and you must file using the exact name and that name is going to be identified in the public record. Against an individual, again, a financing statement against an individual must name the individual. If you use only a debtor's trade name, that is legally insufficient. You must use the actual name. Having said that, however, if the name is incorrect, it can be sufficient unless it is seriously misleading. Best advice is to name the debtor correctly. And you do this before extending credit 
make sure that you have all of the information related to that debtor. Now, sometimes a creditor can perfect a lien through means other than a filing statement. So, one of the most common ways to do this is a creditor can perfect its security interest by possession, by taking possession of the property, of the collateral. So, a secured creditor can perfect its interest in collateral by taking possession of the collateral. And the creditor must hold the collateral and any secured party possessing collateral must also preserve the collateral, meaning prevent it from coming to harm or going to waste. Now, security interest by possession that perfection often hand happens in the case of pawn shops. If you're familiar with pawn shops, pawn shops don't usually buy the goods you bring to them. They loan you money against the goods that you have brought. So you have created a security interest in the personal property that you brought to the pawn shop. The creditor, the pawn shop, is going to protect its security interest by perfecting its interest through possession of the collateral. So they will take possession of the collateral and hold it until such time as you either repay the loan, or if you don't, then they will um, foreclose on the collateral and take it for themselves. Security interest in certain types of collateral may be protected, perfected only by filing. Now, purchase money security interest has special rules. The purchase money security interest generally does not need filing. Ordinarily, when you loan money for the purchase of the item that you are taking as collateral, whether that is real property, like a farm, or personal property, like a car, when there is money that is loaned for the purchase of the collateral, then ordinarily there is no need for filing. So this purchase money security interest arises under specific circumstances. A purchase money security interest in consum consumer goods automatically perfects at the time of sale. So um, a purchase money security interest for a Im involving consumer goods will automatically perfect at the time of sale. So if you go to buy furniture and the furniture company loans you money to purchase the furniture, that loan is going, is going to help to create a purchase money security interest. And again, a purchase money security interest is going to be automatically perfected at the time of sale. That means that the interest in that property held by the lender of the money used to purchase that property is going to be the superior interest to all other creditors because it's going to be created at the same point at which the debt is created. Now, when it comes to vehicles, most states require a certificate of title for vehicles. And if you remember back to our discussion of sales, uh, a title is a formal notice of ownership. And for vehicles, most states require a certificate of title. Now, if there is a certificate of title issued, a security interest in the vehicle can only be perfected if that security interest is reflected on the title. So a security interest in a vehicle, although it sounds like a consumer goods, does not or is not perfected until such time as it is reflected on the certificate of title. 
Now, perfection has to be maintained or it will lapse. A financing statement is only effective for a limited period of time. And ordinarily, that is five years from the date that it is filed. So every five years, be aware that your financing statements are going to lose their effectiveness. What about the debt? Say the debt has not been repaid. How do I maintain my interest in the collateral? Then it will be the responsibility of the creditor to file a continuation statement. And a continuation statement is a statement that is, if it filed within six months prior to the expiration of the financing statement, will extend the financing statement for five years from the expiration date of the original statement. Finance, filing of a continuation statement allows the effectiveness of the statement to be continued indefinitely. And in fact, attempting to file a statement outside of the six month window, either before or after, invalidates the continuation statement. So continuation statements are a, a means of guaranteeing that, that uh, security interests are not uh, perpetual, that we have them set to expire every five years, regardless of whether the debt is repaid or not. If the debt is not repaid, the lender has a means to preserve its rights in the collateral by filing a continuation statement. Now there are certain exceptions to the rule regarding the duration of perfection. Under certain circumstances a financing statement will cease to be effective sooner. If for instance a debtor changes its identity or corporate structure then uh, a financing statement must be filed before the change is uh, becomes misleading. The secured creditor must amend its financing statement to reflect the change in identity. Now perfected security interest in goods remains perfected for a limited time after the debtor moves to another state. After a debtor moves to another state, the secured creditor must re-perfect in the new state in order to retain the priority of its interest in the collateral. So in conclusion, what do we learn today? The concept of the security interest lies at the core of secured transactions law. Perfecting a security interest protects secured creditors from other creditors, and there are different means of perfection. And finally, Perfection must be maintained or it will lapse. That's it, and thanks for listening.